And um, now I'm going to introduce uh, one of our organizers, Amy Berkowitz. Amy Berkowitz is the author of Tender Points um, from uh, T Timeless Infinite Light. Is that the publisher? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, she's the editor of Mondo Bummer Books and the host of Amy's Kitchen Organics Reading Series. And she was a 2014 writer in residence at Alley Cat Bookstore and Gallery. Her writing has appeared in Ducey, Text Sound, Vita, and Uprooted an Anthology on Gender and Illness, among other places. She lives in a rent controlled apartment in San Francisco, and you can find her at amyburko.com. Amy Berkowitz. This is so great. Thank you all for coming. I'm so excited. Ah, I'm so excited. I could just stand up here and say I'm so excited for 10 minutes. Um, but I won't. So before I start, um, I want to let you know that I am going to mention rape. It's nothing too in-depth, but I am going to mention it. So last year, I wrote this book called Tender Points, um, published by the wonderful Timeless Infinite Light. And I was asked recently to participate in a project organized by Canaries. Um, oh, there's Carolyn on the hi. Um, and Carolyn's one of the co-founders, the person whose video we saw earlier. And the project was really interesting. It's called Notes for the Waiting Room, and it aims to subvert the experience of waiting in a doctor's office. Um, I won't go too into that or my contribution, but one of the things I was asked to do for it was to write um, my own annotation for my book, because my book was going to be included in an annotated bibliography of the publication. And it seems like a really hard thing to do, but I'm really glad I did it because um, I think even for myself, it helped clarify like the passion behind and the book and the goals I was trying to meet by writing it. So I'll share that. Tender Points is the story of my chronic pain and the rape that preceded it in the only way trauma can be told. In pieces, fragments, flashes of light, recollections, quotes from Kathleen Hanna, memories of doctor's offices, torn apart and torn out of time. I wrote Tender Points to explore the connections between pain and trauma. I wrote it to feel less alone. I wrote it to call out all the bad doctors. I wrote it to remind us that hysteria was only removed from the DSM in 1980. I wrote it because as a fibromyalgia patient and a rape survivor, I am doubly disqualified as a reliable narrator of my own experience, and that is a challenge I can't resist. So I'll read a few pages from the beginning of the book. A few years after I graduated from college with a degree in literature, I found myself working at the world's largest market research company. My job was analyzing consumer sentiment as expressed in online spaces. This was another way of saying that I spent eight hours a day working on message boards. The company's biggest clients were pharmaceutical companies, which meant that the message boards I lurked on were message boards for people with cancer and other serious illnesses. As you would expect, these messages, written by sick people and their caregivers, were intensely emotional. I am so happy the scans were good, healing hugs and blessings, hugs, hugs to you and yours, love and hugs, prayers and hugs. Take good care, everyone. My prayers are with you. Keep us posted. But the world's largest market research company was uninterested in emotion. What they had me looking for was sentiment. I scored each sample as positive, negative, neutral, unsure, or no opinion. People and their details were shucked away unless they were significant enough to be included in the qualitative results. My job was to leverage this data to identify key factors that would make sick and dying people more interested in purchasing very expensive medicine. DH is on Herbitex Oxaloplatin 5-FU Lucubrin. He has the Herbitex rash bad, but Onco is hesitant to prescribe an antibiotic. It was while I was immersed in this culture of online illness with its own language of acronyms and emoticons that I got sick myself. Working hurt. The precise mousing of data entry made my wrists tingle and go numb. And sitting at the keyboard made my shoulder muscles spasm. 
On the worst days, the stiffness spreads my hips and legs. The doctor in Fort Greene wrote a letter recommending a two-week rest period. I faxed his letter to the HR department of the world's largest market research company. I called and emailed and they didn't answer. I left messages that they didn't return. I applied for short-term disability and my claim was rejected twice. When the two weeks were over, I didn't feel any better. The doctor recommended another week of rest. I faxed, emailed, called HR. I was met with the same radio silence which was starting to sound an awful lot like a static crackle softly whispering, you lazy cunt, we don't believe you're sick, trying to trick us, you worthless piece of shit. Coincidentally, I came back to work the same day as another analyst who had been out sick. He had broken his ankle snowboarding and he was wearing a boot. His cubicle <laughs> was decorated with get well soon cards and an edible arrangement bloomed festive pineapple chunks next to his monitor. My cube was as bare as I'd left it. A get well soon card would have acknowledged the fact of my illness. And as far as the world's largest market research company was concerned, I was faking it. Picturing my cubicle next to my coworkers is a perfect illustration of David B. Morris's differentiation between male and female pain. In the culture of pain, he writes, female pain is regularly dis disregarded, discounted, and dismissed largely because it does not always conform to the clear organic model of appendicitis or a broken arm. So because of that market research job, I actually knew a lot about where to find good online support groups for various illnesses. <laughs> And when I was diagnosed, I did. I, I did look at some fibromyalgia message boards, but I never really saw my experience or my feelings reflected back. So the first time I met someone with fibromyalgia was actually five years later, in December of 2013. I had just finished reading from pages that would eventually be in Tender Points at the Long Hall in Berkeley, and an audience member came up to me afterwards. And they said, hey, I have fibromyalgia too, and I've never actually met anyone else with fibromyalgia. Can I give you a hug? And of course. And so as I'm hugging them, I realize I've never met anyone with fibromyalgia before. Um, and I'm writing a book about it, so it's just so strange. But um, I was really grateful for this meeting and for this new friend, because in this friend, I found someone who got it. I found someone else who felt as angry and uncared for by the capitalist patriarchy of Western medicine as I did. Someone who was tired, someone who was always tired, and someone who also perceived a link between childhood trauma and pain. I'll read a little more from later on in the book. This is a poem called FTP. Doctors are cops, self-select into the profession like a disease that will never be diagnosed because its name is health and its smell is soap. Walk around swinging their clubs, talking too loud, killing people all the time. It's their job, so it's fine. And who can argue with a stethoscope? nasty fat women who want to collect disability checks. Doing stuff makes me tired, give me some money and or drugs. Lazy ass slugs who sit at home and watch Judge Judy while the rest of the world works for a living. 71% of them are fat women who don't ever get off their ass. Sorry if you don't like facts. Anyone who can read an internet article and say ow 11 times can have it. I have to deal with these nutcases at work, and I flat out call them fakers to their face. They need to get up off their lard asses and get a job. They're just whiny people who love to be sick. I knew a woman with it. She was miserable and had a whole MySpace dedicated to the constant pain. At the Vital Forum Symposium in 2013, Melissa Bezeo asked questions. 
Why people who are sick are also looked at as waste products in society. Why people, especially women, especially sick women, do not want to draw too much attention to themselves. What does it mean to talk about yourself? Welcome to the MySpace of my constant pain. So I sent some of this writing to a friend who also writes about pain. She sent me an email back about my writing and her writing, and she added, also, on a side slash main note, I'm sorry to hear you're living with chronic pain. It sucks in every way. I don't remember how it feels not to be in pain. At the doctor's office, pain scales are impossible because I lost my zero. I choose a number because I'm supposed to choose a number. It's only when the pain is severe or when the pain prevents me from doing something that I'm forced to think about it. But even when I'm not thinking about it, it's still there. My body is writing BART and it's in pain. My body is peeling an orange and it's in pain. My body is worrying about something stupid and it's in pain. My body is writing this and it's in pain. What I'm trying to say is, I like what my friend wrote. Chronic pain is always on a side slash main note. Oh, no, wait, that was just me making a noise to say I'm about to say one more thing. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I just want to finish by saying that um, not at the risk of sounding corny, um, I think I finally found the kind of support group I was looking for, and it's the friend that I write to, the friend that I met at that reading, and everybody here, um, everyone in this room, it feels like this is the kind of support that I was looking for. Thank you.